you'll soon get a mass movement through the country saying enough's enough, we're not going to go with this anymore. And in terms of signposting, uh, people that have actually already been brave enough to stick their head above the parapet, yes. uh, I know I was inspired by my now colleague, a guy called Tony Rook, who um, in Sussex refused to pay his council tax. This was under section 15 article 3. Right. But he also um, refused to pay his TB license on the same grounds. Now, I mentioned Tony because he's made a film about the war yeah, and about correct. this stance, which is reasonable cause, um, which shows the atrocities and the outcome of our aggressive foreign policy and our illicit entering into war in Afghanistan and Iraq, which you're talking about. And you've mentioned these wars, and you've mentioned how these have escalated now into Libya and into Pakistan, and to some extent Syria. Now, what sort of volume of people have been affected, do you think, in terms of our policy? It's just horrifying. Um, the minimum deaths that have taken place since uh, October the 7th, 2001, I put out about 220,000, the very minimum, directly killed by the actions of American and British armed forces. So that um, the Iraq body count has made a, a to has totaled up the number of Iraqis who were killed by a direct action. So direct action is killing perhaps a quarter of a million people. But that's not the, the real issue, it's the people who die afterwards because you know the, the water supplies have been poisoned or the, uh, their, their injuries cause them not to be able to, to live any longer or they, the use of DU, depleted uranium and radioactive um, materials. So in Iraq, for instance, cancers for children and others have gone up 700%. It's horrendous what's happened there because of our use of depleted uranium, which is supposed to have no effect but has a dramatic effect. Now, I reckon there are about five to six deaths for every death in action as a result of a bomb. There are five to six associated deaths. Mm -hmm. And in total, I believe that the, the figure is somewhere, some people will say it's up, upwards of two to three million people that died. Um, there's an Australian um, university professor who has done a lot of work on this, uh, Gideon Pollier. Um, but say we take the sort of lowest figure and the highest figures, you're talking at least one and a half million people, and at least 35% of those are children. So that's more than a third, so that's over half a million children have been killed in the last 10 years. Now, that I, I've gone back in history and I cannot think, even when Herod was killing children in the you know, time of Christ, the firstborn child and so on, the numbers are, are just utterly horrendous. We have never ever behaved like this before as a nation. So America and Britain, the atrocities of what are going on the last 10 years are the worst in our history. Like, you know, we've, instead of killing soldiers, we now target and kill civilians. 95% of the deaths that have taken place in the last 11 years are civilians, mm -hmm. men, women and children. Now what is that about? We have a nation that psyche is primarily focused on the war heroes. Then there's more sympathy for those troops that are committing these acts under order than there is for the, vic the innocent victims. That's, that's the way I see it. And that's in every aspect of society, even within, for instance, institutions like the church. Yeah. They're more likely to be sympathetic to the, the soldiers who've come back with injuries than they are to the deaths uh, of people in Iraq, Afghanistan and, and the Middle East. Um, and that saddens me greatly in oh, terms of how I, I, I don't underestimate the task we've got of changing the hearts and minds of the nation in terms of these are our brothers and sisters. Yes. Uh, nothing less, nothing more, and that we should love them just the same as our neighbour next door. And that when we see these, these families totally and utterly destroyed, yes. um, 
by all policy, a policy that was um, you know, instigated by Tony Blair in, in Italy, I think, yep. uh, over the last decade. A book continues and is showing no sign of abating by our current government. When we have that, we really do have to climb a, a uphill, but change the hearts and minds, and somehow have, get the nation to have some moral courage yes. on these issues. I agree with you. But there is something that they can do to benefit themselves in their own market by withholding these tax. But ultimately the decision comes down to the soul and that you've got to be outraged and if you're so outraged with this, you've got to be prepared to make that stance. Yes. I think it was Edmund Burke says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Perfect. And at the moment the nation by and large is doing nothing. And what we're we're trying to give a message loud and clear here that is incumbent on each and every individual to make that stance and start withholding the taxes because only in that way if we can hurt the pockets of the government and create a critical mass can we get this awful atrocious foreign policy stopped in its tracks and yes. redressed. Um, what I, I want to f finish Chris on you know, take you back when you first started and what was it that at a personal level that gave you the courage uh, to mount this campaign against all odds and keep it going uh, up to present in spite of the obstructions and the blockages that you faced and the closing ranks in every corner? Yeah, I, I sometimes wonder. <laughs> I think basically it's, it's just the horror of the fact, it goes back to what you were saying, we're making heroes of our soldiers. What is heroic about murdering children um, from five miles away, or whatever it is, you know, with missiles and so on? And here is a totally innocent person murdered. And it's that issue of we cannot, I've been brought up to believe that murder is wrong, that we've got to live with everybody, that, you know, we just have a duty uh, and a conscience, and, and it's. Uh, the feeling that you know nobody is doing anything and we are just constantly being told by our leaders that it's the right thing to do and I can't ever believe that it's the right thing to do I just cannot the thing that keeps me going is every now and again you get something outrageous happening and I think for instance um, when 559 MPs were told by um, David Cameron that we were firing cruise missiles into Libya. 559 MPs voted in favour of it and 14 I think it was against. Now that's the biggest majority in recent history. So here are, you know, and I, I just despair. That's right. What are these people? Yeah. Is there a human being amongst them? Uh, I just don't know. And notwithstanding the fact, the very fact, I mean, all war is, is morally wrong, but to go to war on the basis of the lies that we, our, country, our nation has been on, and we can look back at the weapons of mass destruction and the David Kelly um, yes. saga, um, and the sort of doubts, the serious doubts about how he came to his death, yeah. um, and the 45 minute threat. Now all of this, and. The, this bogus, this hoax threat that somehow those in the Middle East that are about to attack us and cause us great danger, we are under threat from Islamic terrorism, all has been greatly exaggerated yes. in order to try and justify what we are doing. And that continues and there doesn't seem to be any politicians actually searching for the truth. No. They're, no. they're all... Um, willing and able to turn blind eyes to what is now quite obvious, the, the wrongs. So it's not just a case of it's morally wrong, we have gone to war on lies and the lies are now um, are mainly obvious. Yes. Um, I think the biggest lie of all is, is the lie that it's lawful. Mm -hmm. um, they have said over and over again the rationale for going to war with Afghanistan Iraq and Libya is that it was authorised by the UN Security Council by resolution operating under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. 
Mm -hmm. That is a lie, a straightforward lie. The United Nations can never authorise the use of armed force. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they never tell us that, and our government deliberately leaves those phrases out. Yes. There was a phrase in Article 41, uh, the Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions. The British government leaves out the phrase not involving the use of armed force and tells us that it has been authorised. Mm -hmm. That is a dreadful lie and it's that lie which takes us to war and makes all our lawyers in this country are going along with it. I can't believe it. But it's these sort of issues that we've got to somehow expose the lies that are underpinning every action of the British government in the last 10, 12 years, and it's horrendous. And there are other uh, sort of neutral currencies, such as Malaysia, that uh, have, have brought right. to the attention uh, and, and have brought to trial in their own way um, the issue of Tony Blair and George Bush in yeah, the exactly. legality of wars. Um, have you anything to say on, on what other nations think on this? I mean, I know only too well that there are so many people out there who know damn well that what we are doing and what America is doing is totally wrong. It's evil under the, the law. Um, and thank God for those nations like Malaysia and others who are trying to take action on it. Mm -hmm. We just need more coordinated international action to use the laws that we've got and the International Criminal Court. And what I would really love to see is our leaders, the main ones, you know, Blair, Straw, Hoon, Goldsmith, Brown, Cameron, Clegg, uh, Prescott and so on, standing in front of the International Criminal Court, rather like the Germany's leaders were were laid out in front of the, um, the court at Nuremberg. We need 20 of our leaders laid out uh, in the International Criminal Court answering to charges of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. And then I think we might have an effect worldwide. Yes. yes. Uh, and so we've got to do it and I think Malaysia was a good example. Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal was a great example of what can be done and it's dangerous for Bush and Blair ever to go to the left. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. We need to make sure that it happens in every European country. Yes. We're all signed up to the Rome Statute. We've all said that we will uphold and maintain it and would now need to do it. And instead of just bringing African leaders to court, yes. we need to bring our leaders yes. to court. We won't be able to get uh, Bush and, and Obama and uh, the Americans because they've not signed up to it mm -hmm. but there is a way of ensuring that they can be brought to court in America and that's very important. The Genocide Convention which was signed in 1948 uh, after 40 years tr and um, Senator Proxmire in America spent 19 years in Congress trying to persuade um, uh, the American Congress to sign up to and ratify the Genocide Convention. He finally succeeded just before he retired after 19 years of trying. And in 1988, President Reagan signed the Genocide Convention Implementation Act in America. And that says that if any American citizen commits genocide, then they can be charged and tried in American courts. Mm -hmm. And they have. And Cheney and Bush and Blair and all uh, and, um, Wolf of Bits and all the rest of them mm -hmm. have committed crimes of genocide and they must be held to account in court there. They can also be held to account for murder as their um, uh, Vincent Bugliosi has written in his excellent book called The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder. Mm -hmm. I recommend that to anybody you know, if you want to find out what can, be, what can happen. Mm -hmm. And um, so holding them to account in America and Tony Blair and others to account in the Hague, I think we can change the world. Yeah. And I'd second that. I, mean, I remember it, it reminds me of my situation on the day I got dismissed from South Yorkshire Police for speaking truth about. I said to the dismissing officer, um, 
the police uh, on the 2nd of September 2010, the police service are about to nobble the wrong Tony, and South Yorkshire police are indeed rendering themselves at risk of being complicit in the murder of innocent women and children in war-torn Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, I said that to the dismissing officer, and in the same way he, he said, well your views could be correct and uh, truthful, but it's not where we are today. But we've got to get the nation to a different position and a different conceptual model of how um, we should behave ethically in the world. Um, wars are illegal and it's morally wrong what we're doing. And what we're saying, the message is coming across loud and clear from you, is that we have uh, an obligation to legally now to make that stance. Um, as well as that, it can, it can benefit by you keeping your taxes to yourself away from the government who are actually perpetrating these illegal acts. Yeah. So, I think on that note, I think uh, absolutely. I'd like to thank, thank you, you very much for thank giving you. that insight. Uh, it's been a privilege to interview. Thank you very much indeed.